Recent research on a palate bone from a Mesozoic bird has just turned one aspect of supposed bird evolution on its head. So join me as I chat with Dr. Matt McLean about this new finding. G'day, it's Ken Colson here from Creation Unfolding, and today we're going to kick off a series of short fossil related discussions with Dr. Matt McLean, who is the chair of the science department at the Masters University in Santa Clarita, California, where he teaches classes in geology, paleobiology, and paleontology uh, and that's related to the new geoscience program that they have at the university so i'm going to stick a plug in here while i can i actually graduated from the Masters university way back when and they didn't have a geoscience program then well they do now if you're in any way interested in getting into a science related field where there is a strong foundation in six-day creationism then get hold of dr matt mclean from the university so Dr. McLean, welcome back to the channel. Uh, perhaps we can start with you telling us a little bit about uh, yourself, your background, uh, what you teach at the university, and what your areas of specialty are. Yeah, so um, I got my uh, bachelor's at Cedarville University in Ohio and um, did my PhD at Loma Linda University um, on the taphonomy of a dinosaur bone bed and uh, looking at tooth marks and things like that. And then um, I teach over here, I teach a lot of biology and geology and paleontology classes. Um, so uh, like the gen ed geology class for the non-majors, as well as lots of the specific major classes. Um, and I get to teach some fun um, paleontology ones on dinosaurs and different things like that. And most of my research is vertebrate paleontology. So it's working on dinosaurs and pterosaurs and uh, phytosaurs and different interesting extinct animals. Um, and I get to include students in that, which is a lot of fun, um, and train them up and in, in being a, um, a scientist who's a Christian committed to the word of God. Excellent. Excellent. Um, so the, the new, the paper that we're looking at, I mean, literally came out just a few weeks ago. Is that right? Yeah. Okay. Excellent. Right. So, um, so just to start off with maybe summarize what this paper is about. I, I don't know if you can maybe bring it up on the screen there. Yeah, I can do that. Okay. So this is the paper right here. Um, the paper's title is Cretaceous Ornithurine Supports a Neonathus Crown Bird Ancestor it's by Benito et al. Um, and it was published in Nature, um, which is like one of the big prestigious uh, journals. And because it's a Nature paper, it's actually pretty short. Um, there's some supplemental information and things like that. But um, it's a pretty short read, but obviously it's technical because it's in that kind of journal. So, um, yeah, want to talk through it? Yeah, just basically what it summarizes, what, what, what sort of just a kind of a three minute, two minute overview. Yeah. So um, essentially they were looking at a fossil of a bird um, that was found uh, a while ago, actually was, was studied about 20 years ago, but they couldn't expose all the bones because they're very delicate, you know, bird bones as fossils. And um, so they actually were using new methods to be able to look inside the rock. They found new elements, redescribed ones that were previously unknown. And they realized this was a new species um, and genus. They named it Genavis finalidens. Um, and they realized that it was an ichthyornithine. Um, so these are an extinct group of birds that had teeth. Uh, kind of imagine it as a seagull with teeth, essentially. Mm -hmm. And they were known from the Cretaceous. Um, and so far, there's really only one type of them. It's ichthyornis, which is known from the 1800s. Um, and so this is the first one they found is uh, supposedly 20 million years um, later than ichthyornis. And the really shocking part of its discovery was that they found um, part of the palate. And palates, I mean, bo or pal bones of the palate are very, very fragile, um, even more than the other bird bones, since they don't typically preserve with any detail. Mm -hmm. And what they found was that this palate bone, but it's called a pterygoid, looked remarkably similar to the kinds of pterygoids you find in certain modern birds, but not other modern birds. Mm -hmm. So if we look at, you can see a little bird cladogram here, a little phylogeny. Um, Neornithes, this is the true birds, um, the modern birds, the crown birds over here. And Genavis is out here. Okay, so it's not in that crown bird group. It's got teeth, some other weird things. Um, these crown birds, there's two basic types to them. So they're defined based on their palate. Um, the one is called paleonathe, which means old jaw. Mm -hmm. And the other one's called neonathe, which means new jaw. Mm -hmm. So an old jaw bird 
is like an ostrich or an emu, they can't, they don't have a mobile palate. The bones don't have like these extra joints that allow movement there. But neonaths, which are most of our birds today, so that's all our songbirds and hummingbirds and crows and, you know, uh, hawks and all those kinds of things, mm -hmm. they do have that. They can actually have a, a movable um, palate right there. And so um, it was thought that the neonaths, since new jaw, those were the birds that are more derived, more evolved. Those, those features showed up later. Whereas the paleonaths, the old jaws, those ones are more like what you see in a reptile um, or like a velociraptor or something like that. And so they assumed, okay, that's that's like the old condition. But now we've got a bird that's not in neonathes, that's got the neonath palette. And they're saying, what is going on here? It looks like actually they're saying in this article that the neonath palette is the um, kind of ancestral condition for all these birds mm -hmm. and that paleonaths are doing something weird with their jaws. They're doing something completely different. And so this is very unexpected, kind of turn things on its head. Mm -hmm. So this is obviously something that uh, the, the paleontological world is not, it, it sort of changes the way people have been viewing the evolution of the bird, right? Yeah. Okay, excellent. And so when you say uh, the, the, the Palantine uh, bone, I guess it's made up of two bones, is that right? The palate's got a few different bones, yeah. Bones, okay. And so in these paleonaths, these bones are all fused. Uh, and that that's the condition that we have in like a velociraptor, something like that. Yeah, essentially. They're, they're not, there's not a movable component to it. Yeah. Okay, okay. good. All right. So, um, okay. So as I was looking through the paper, and yeah, it's very technical, uh, I did read the paper and try to, to gather as much information as I, I could. I'm not a paleontologist, so I, but, I, but I think I've got the gist of what's going on. Uh, but they did talk about uh, its relationship to ichthyornis, um, and uh, they, took, they talked about a 20 million year stasis uh, with ichthyornis. So ichthyornis, I think, uh, shows up in the fossil record. Again, we're using secular dates. Uh, sort of about 90 million years ago uh, from a secular perspective. And um, and that's Ick you're pointing out right there. And then uh, this new fossil, Jan Avis, turns up uh, around 67 million years ago from a, again, a conventional perspective. Uh, why is that important from a creationist perspective? Yeah, it's really interesting. Um, if you look again at the the little um diagram here and you can see all these different types of mesozoic birds that are extinct right um and you notice like a lot of them you got all different types just appearing very rapidly one after another sometimes at the same time different groups showing up when you look immediately above the cretaceous when you look in the cenozoic tons of different birds just show up all of a sudden without a fossil record um beforehand leading to them and um so yeah we're seeing new bird groups showing up left and right Yet, in the uppermost Cretaceous, you've got this one type of bird that's essentially identical for, I don't know, something like 20 million years um, is really unusual, right? Um, this uh, Gen Avis and Ichthyornis are barely different at all. I mean, it's it's mainly size and there's just a few little things here and there that they're able to notice are, are actually different. Yeah. Um, and so that's really, really surprising because you would think an animal like a bird would be undergoing it's, it's facing a lot of environmental stresses you think that it would have lots of you know natural selection mutations all those kinds of things we normally talk about with evolution happening right. and there should be lots and lots of change going on like you see in all the other bird groups yeah. and yet in fact um you see a bunch of stasis yeah i mean i did see in the paper they were talking about uh from a conventional perspective again uh you know birds have this rapid uh you know adaptation rapid evolution uh, right after the Cretaceous, uh, with like you say, birds just sort of showing up all over the place, just, uh, you know, completely different kinds of birds, which again would uh, fit a creationist perspective. Uh, and yet uh, this particular uh, genus goes against the grain uh, by staying sort of the same for 20 million years. So that in and of itself is a, a pretty interesting fact uh, from a creationist perspective. Uh, yes. Good. Okay, what about other things? Um, why else would this be important from a creationist perspective? I think you maybe you, you had a, a cladogram there. Maybe you could pull that up and yeah. uh, we can have a look at that um, to maybe explain in a bit more uh, detail uh, why this is significant. Yeah, so this is just a really simplified 
um, cladogram showing kind of what we're talking about in the paper. Jan Avis here is an ichthyornithine. Um, it's in this group. Our modern birds are all in this group up here. It's called neornithes or aves. So I, I can't see your a cursor there. So oh, uh, let me. So I'm going to go ahead. I, your cursor is stuck on ichthyornithes. Oh, so, weird. So that's where, for the audience, that arrow there, that's what he's talking about. That's the group uh that this uh bird uh, this modern or this fossil that was just found uh is in gen avis is in that group if you wanted these so i can do the cursor for I you might, i might be able to draw here as we go okay sure um, you can, you can yeah it. so our modern birds are all up here right? okay so this is, can, we can see this that this is um which is also called avis yeah. and these are the two palette constructions i was talking about there's the neonathe the new ones and the paleonathe the old ones right, right. So back um, for a very long time in the history of ornithology, the study of birds, uh, people assumed that paleonaths right here, the old condition, yeah. those were the primitive birds, right? right. Those were the, the oldest birds. These are things like ostriches, emus, kiwis, kiwis, rias. These were thought to be kind of like more primitive birds, whereas our neonaths, the rest of the birds were thought to be more derived uh, more you know they've got this specialized palette they, they're um they're farther along that evolutionary tree and right. it's like i said it's embedded in the names yeah. and so this assumption just went unchallenged um you know for over 100 years people just thought that was the case mm -hmm. and then finding the neonath palette way down here in ichthyornithes right this is really surprising right so what do we do with this i mean it's possible that the ichthyornithene condition is uh, convergent with the one in our neonaths, right? That they just independently evolved it. Um, they're suggesting, though, that I think that this entire group right here um, all would have that right. neonath palette. And then animals like Hesperornithines and paleonaths would have lost that. So this is interesting to us, regardless of what position you take um, and the solution for this as an evolutionist. This is interesting, the creationists, because, you know, we're often told, like, hey, you can see this pattern. How else could you explain this pattern? It has to be this way, right? Um, that's kind of the way it's explained. And you say, look, we've been studying this for 100 years, and we haven't found anything to the contrary. But, you know, all it takes is one fossil to suddenly shake up everything. Mm -hmm. And a lot of these um, evolutionary narratives, right, these stories about how different structures of all different creatures appear, those kinds of things, they sound really, really convincing, and they're based on evidence, but we forget that they are stories, they're hypotheses, um, and, you know, I think that's a really, really important thing for us to remember as creationists, that when we feel challenged by one of those things, yeah, maybe we don't have an answer right now, but that's okay, just because it's a really compelling good story doesn't automatically make it true. Right. Um, and it may be that in a few years, somebody finds a fossil that shows that that's actually not the case, right. um, which is pretty common in the history of paleontology. Yeah, excellent. So again, just summarizing that, uh, what Dr. McLean is saying is that this uh, paleonath condition, which is in, uh, well, paleonaths has this fused palate. Uh, they thought, they assumed that, that came from some more ancient uh, ancestor. Uh, so sort of uh, of an advanced velociraptor, something like that, and that it sort of just stayed uh, in this clay and is still with us today. Uh, however, um, you know, finding it down here uh, in this ichthyornis group um, challenges that assumption. That means if they find it in this group, either uh, this condition evolved twice, which is called convergence, or uh, all of these birds from Ichthyornis onwards in this uh, this clade here, they all evolved uh, they all evolved this new trait, and the Paleonaths then must have re-evolved the ancient trait. Is that sort of right? Okay, yep. so it's one of those two stories, right? But I think. What, I, don't, sorry, go ahead. Yeah, I was going to say, you know, interesting thing in the paper too. It's not really the point, but it, it came out um, through their research is that. You know, we assumed because we assumed that this paleonath condition is the older condition, um, people just didn't really focus on it that much. They just assumed, oh, it's not the new condition. So it's all the same kind of thing. Right. Well, they did some studies looking at the shape of the pterygoid in paleonath birds, and they found out they're wildly different from each other. Yeah. All of our neonath birds have really pretty similar looking palates, right. um, or at least the pterygoid is very similar. Whereas with the paleonaths, I mean, it's just like, very 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 different more different from each other sometimes than they are from you know uh, the neonaths are from each other and so 
Um, all of those kinds of things are challenging. We, we put so many assumptions into what we do that we don't even realize when we study and when we try and understand things as, as scientists. Right. And I think what's really, I think a, a really good take home for us as creationists is that uh, we're all trying to tell a story. Uh, all, all scientists, I mean, everyone, it doesn't matter what your, uh, what your discipline is, we're trying to tell a story. We're trying to interpret things in the past. And oftentimes, I mean, I find myself, uh, you know, I read a paper, a paleontology paper, and it sounds very, very convincing. Mm -hmm. um, but it just goes to show, you know, I could have been well convinced about this older story, but then all of a sudden a new fossil comes up and it turns things upside down. And this really is a turning upside down paper in, in this respect. And so I think uh, this is where we need to trust the word of God as our ultimate authority. Okay, well, look, uh, uh, as I said at the beginning, these are just going to be short segments. Uh, and, I, and we just want to cover briefly uh, some particular specific uh, concept in uh, some modern areas of research. So I don't know what we're going to talk about next time, uh, but uh, we'll be looking forward to that. So Dr. McLean, I want to uh, thank you for joining us today. Yep. And uh, well, for everyone out there, uh, don't forget, uh, I do have actually a series uh, that I've done on um, theropods and uh, whether or not they evolved the ability to fly. So I'll go ahead and stick uh, part one of that series in the description for those of you who are interested. So go ahead uh, and look at part one, and that will take you to a three-part series. Um, and again, uh, that's all from me. Again, Ken Colson here at Creation Unfolding. Don't forget, uh, we've got the website, www.creationunfolding.com for more resources. Uh, so on the website, you'll find more references. Uh, I go into uh, more sort of more detail on a lot of the videos in written form. Uh, there's a book, of course, if you're interested as well. And of course, I've got that new donate button as well. So uh, if, uh, you know, the Lord puts it on your heart to donate any amount whatsoever, that would be much appreciated. That link is also in the description. And as always, uh, if, look, if you were blessed in any way uh, by this video, then please hit that like button, hit the subscribe button, ring the bell as well uh, for easier access to more videos as they come up. Okay, thank you and goodbye.